All right, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Welcome to our AMA. It is about sharpening your competitive edge and helping your sales team with head-to-head -head deals, increasing revenue, doing all of the great things that you want to do. My name is Xavier Holland. I'm the head of customer marketing here at Crayon, and I'll be moderating this session. I am joined by some truly incredible people in the competitive intelligence space. We're so happy to have them. And before I get to who they are and what they'll tell you, it's a couple of housekeeping items. As a reminder, this is being recorded. We will send out the recording within 24 hours so you can recap what we've seen and, uh, and look over it again. You can also use the chat box to chat and ask additional questions for our experts. We have a good amount of questions in the queue, but uh, if we have time, we'll get to all the questions that you ask. So, uh, so do go ahead and keep sending in those questions, even though we do have uh, a pretty exciting queue of questions to answer already. And that's it. No more spiel, no more ado. I will introduce our three speakers. First, we have Clara Smith. Clara is the Senior Product Marketing Manager at Slack. We have Andy McCotter Bicknell, who's the Head of Competitive Intelligence at Zoom Info. And finally, we have Alex McDonald, who's the Head of Market and Competitive Intelligence at Airtable. I will stop talking and let them talk a little bit about themselves before we can do the questions. The floor is yours, yes. Hey everyone, nice to meet you all. Well, virtually meet you all. Uh, as Xavier said, I'm Andy McCotter Bicknell. Uh, I lead up competitive intel over at Zoom Info, so I'm looking forward to chatting with you. Thank you, Andy. Hi, everybody. My name is Clara Smith. I'm a senior product marketing manager at Slack, currently focusing on competitive intelligence and so excited to be here. Thank you all for attending and can't wait to have an amazing session with you today. Yeah, I am also super excited to be in, in great company here. Uh, Alex McDonald, leading competitive over at Airtable, um, researcher and a marketer, and uh, yeah, here to here to geek out on all things competitive intel. So collectively, collectively, we have over twenty years of CI experience in this Zoom call, and I'm sure much more in the audience. So uh, let's let's get to it. Let's start asking and answering some questions. Question number one, for small organizations just embarking down the CI path, what are the first steps they should take? How, how should they get started if they're just kind of getting used to CI? This is an awesome question. So in the, I'm gonna speak to this strictly because I started as you know that generalist and I continued on that path to eventually owning the competitive program Zoom Info. And the number one thing that really helped me understand our landscape is, this is going to be a little old school, but I wrote a monthly newsletter and I sent it to our executive team. Not only was that helpful for our executive team to like work with me directly, help me understand exactly the questions to ask, how I should be viewing our competitive landscape, but it helped me every single month kind of distill all that information down onto, you know, a piece of paper, essentially. I mean, it was a virtual piece of paper, but you know what I mean? It helped me understand exactly kind of like, okay, so like, what are the big players in the competitive landscape doing? What story uh, is currently going on? Who are all the players? How do we play into that story? And it helped me kind of just understand like what questions to specifically ask as it related to competitive intel. And so over time, that newsletter, it, you know, helped me, it compounded, you know, over time. And uh, your knowledge, you'd, you'd be surprised at kind of the insights that you're able to glean just from simply kind of like taking that extra step and like writing down your own thoughts. And so that would be my number one recommendation. Yeah, Andy, I have to jump in here. I'd say I completely agree. I started out my career in competitive intelligence with the foundation of a newsletter, but pre-newsletter, you're probably wondering, well, who do I track in my newsletter? How do I get information? How do I build a culture of sharing and trust? And that's where I would recommend to start, right, is work with your management, work with your executives to tear out your competitors to say, these are the ones that we're going to be tracking as a tier one versus tier two versus tier three. And then you'll have the ability to kind of cut through the noise that's out there within your respective industries. And uh, the sales team will understand and your executive team and whoever your newsletter is going to will understand who you're prioritizing and how they can prioritize that as well. And a great way to kind of start that is by looking at your CRM data too and understanding who are you winning against, who are you losing against and uh, doubling down on that. So anything for you, Alex? I'm curious. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll add one more principle that is always with me. I know you two are, are huge advocates of this as well. Um, treating CI as, as, a, as a cycle and especially as a two-way process between yourself as the CI kind of curator and all the other people around the organization that are, that are going to be benefiting from your work, particularly uh, groups like sales and customer success. Um, let's say as you're getting started, you identify your, what your first win is going to be. Maybe it's a particular competitor that you want to do an investigation on, uh, or, or win loss, uh, or maybe it's three battle cards this quarter, whatever you can time box and specify like that approach that with an attitude that you're going to come with a perspective. You're going to come with some work, but people all around the organization already have a ton of information and perspective and opinions about competition. And if you can just be the curator of all that, making space for all that information to, to move around and flow around freely um, and have a, a two-way uh, connection between yourself as that kind of center of knowledge and all these other places around the organization that also hold it, you're going to be off to a great start. That's a very good answer. Which leads us into our next question. So there's a ton of CI information about competitors, partners, customers out there now. How do you get in there and really narrow down what matters and prioritize what's important about to, to know? Yeah, I'll jump in here. I would say that you really wanna think about the so what, right? So you have all these PRs going left and right. You have these product announcements. You have maybe competitors pricing against you, right? And I'd figure out what is the so what of all that news to impact your strategy, your own roadmap, your competitive deals. If you think it's going to impact, you know, the way that your products are being positioned, the way that they're priced, the way that they're developed, then that probably matters, right? But it's up to you to figure out what are those tenants within your program and who do you serve? So by figuring that out and going back to the basics, then you're able to figure out that so what and understand what truly matters and cut through the noise there. I think uh, in my early career as, um, as a CI analyst, I started figuring out, you know, what was in scope and what was out of scope in terms of that newsletter that Andy mentioned and figuring out what was in scope, what would impact deals, what would impact executive decision-making that helped me cut through the noise. I'll jump in with one that it might sound a little bit trite, but it is the simple question that I'm always coming back to anytime we're picking up uh, uh, some new Intel or competitor comes out with a new product. And that's simply, what might this mean for customers? What might this mean for customers? Is this going to make their life a little bit easier, a little bit harder, a little more complicated? Um, that is the test that, that we're always asking ourselves. And, and, and so if you find yourself with kind of like a, a body of research and facts and data that feels uh, like maybe a, a, a lot of information, but not necessarily a lot of signal or, or a lot of true intelligence, um, one good, good test is to try to compress and distill everything that you're thinking about down to uh, the, the actual talking points that you might use if you were talking to a customer or maybe to an industry analyst about you and your product's place in the world and how you view your competitor's place in the world and in this market. And when you actually force yourself to go through that exercise of what would I really say about us versus the competition, um, all the, all the kind of noise starts to, to fall away and, and kind of move into the appendix uh, of, your, of your research work. So I, I try to do that if I'm ever feeling overwhelmed is, is actually apply that filter and, and press through um, an actual response, actual talking points. What do you think, Andy? Yeah, no, I totally agree. And if I could just add one thing, I, I think that there's a difference between awareness and then having, how should I say this? Awareness of like your broader market, right? And it, it kind of says this in the question, competitors, partners, customers, et cetera. There's a difference between being aware of that entire ecosystem, but then focusing your attention on just kind of a smaller group that actually is impacting your organization, potentially in a negative way, taking away wallet share, taking your customers, et cetera. And so kind of to Alex's point where, you know, you're asking, okay, well, what does this mean for our customers? You can also ask that same question, but flip it around. So like, what does this mean for us? So like whenever I see some new insights or PRs or like I'm speaking to an industry analyst, you know, and they're sharing new information that I didn't previously know, that's something that I consistently ask. It's okay, this is interesting information, but like, what does this really mean for us at Zoom Info? 
Um, sometimes it's really important and it's like, okay, I need to like make a game plan and be proactive about this new information. And sometimes you can listen to it and you can go, okay, well, that's interesting, but there's not really anything that I need to do after knowing that, but it's still good to know that because again, it helps you kind of, again, compound as you're learning more about your industry and seeing kind of like the story that's developing. Um, and again, it can just kind of help you cement exactly where you fit into that story. Andy, you made an interesting point in there about establishing a broad awareness, but then also narrow focus. I've never thought of it as that, that coupling those two ideas before, but they're totally compatible, right? Like you should never be, even when you're starting, I feel like you shouldn't be scoping down your CI program to the point where you're not even catching like headlines or news or product launches from those tier two, tier three competitors. Like you at least want to catch that stuff, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that you're going to go do a deep investigation and speak to 15 customers and all that kind of stuff about it. Right. So it's that broad awareness, but then also a narrow focus. I never thought of it that way. (laughs) Well, the reason that I'm thinking of it that way is because I always, I mean, I was really lucky when I first started at zoom info and that we already had some established relationships with industry analysts. And you notice that when you have these conversations, they're not like just talking to you about, um, you know, the, your immediate competitors. They're usually talking about broader market trends, who's playing a role in each trend. And I like to think of competitive intel within an organization. It's like, you know, your in-house analyst. And so you need to be able to think that way so you can identify different trends that are going on. And exactly like where, if you're, you have to be selective, I mean, as an organization anyway, about like which trends you want to play into. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how I've always thought about it. What are the yeah, things I'm to, seeing emerging? Sorry, go on, Clara. Oh yeah, just to close it out, Xavier, I know we have plenty of questions to get to. Just to close it out, it all might seem very overwhelming, especially for somebody who's trying to start a brand new CI program. I think the easiest thing to do is to create that culture of sharing. Um, a lot of people can you know, send out an email with a PR to the whole company or post it in a Slack channel, but the beauty of your job and what you do on a daily basis is distilling the magic of the so what and what does this mean to my company? And that is the hard lifting that a lot of people don't want to do. They just want to share it and kind of walk away from it. So I'd encourage you to focus on that as an area where you can deliver a unique value appropriately. That, that's really, really great. And, and sort of one of the themes I'm seeing through these answers is it's not really about finding one particular piece of information. It's about figuring out what the right questions are to ask and asking those questions and letting that process guide you rather than saying, oh, you need to know their revenue, you need to know their size, you need to know whatever. It's like figuring out what's important to us and then then going from there. So thank you for those answers. Our next question, very simple. Where would you start when it comes to competitive analysis and tracking? Where's where's sort of square one? Uh, Again, if you're maybe new to the CI space and you're looking to build that program, how do you how do you hop in? So this has changed for me over time, but my how I feel now is I really think that you should just go to wherever your ideal customers are hanging out or just or, or speaking, you know, so in a lot of cases, I mean, communities are a huge thing right now, right? Um, and a lot of us are sharing a lot of ourselves and our companies on social media. And so I think that really keeping your ear to the ground on uh, what your ideal customers are saying and their like real experiences, I think that's huge because you're going to get more than just competitive Intel information. Like you'll get some of that. You'll get sometimes people uh, asking questions about specific vendors that you might compete with. Uh, you might get pain points that they're experiencing with those competitors, but you'll also just get their overall pain points which I think is almost more important than these competitive insights. You know, you, you can actually understand it, like what your customers, your potential customers are wanting and uh, kind of what their daily workflow is. And so again, that can help you establish your competitive strategy um, and, and make it something that's beyond just like pricing or feature comparisons. You can actually play into these real experiences that your ideal customers are experiencing, experiences that they're experiencing. You know what I mean? <laughs> Love it, Andy. Yeah, I, uh, I I get kind of recalled to this specific quote that somebody at Slack made kind of part of our CI program, which is to be, you know, competitor aware, but customer obsessed. And you could easily get 
completely overwhelmed with where you start. But if you really think about how does this going to impact my customer? How is it going to align the business value with my customer? And how is it going to move the needle with, for my customer? Then you have that uh, kind of the ability to cut through the noise. I mentioned it before um, to Andy's point about kind of creating a newsletter, but I would definitely align internally around which competitors are going to track. Sounds very basic 101, but in my early career, we had, you know, 30 plus competitors that, you know, everybody thought was on the same playing field and by tearing them out and figuring out who is our threat based on our data, based on the company's focus, based on who's innovating the fastest, that'll allow you to focus. And that focus, I think, is so critical, especially for, say, PMMs out there that are doing this 10, 20 percent of their job. Yeah, a, a huge plus one to the idea of anchoring on customer needs when you start before just running out and gathering every fact and figure about competitors. I'm going to drop a link in the chat actually to this resource that GitLab puts out. Um, so GitLab has this like very radical culture of transparency, uh, including all of their competitive intel and comparison material just on their website for customers who might be evaluating them to make a decision. And you'll notice across the top, there's like 10 or so verbs up here that are all the key jobs to be done that, a Git, that GitLab asserts their customer might need to do with their product. Every competitor in the space then is, uh, is held up against, oh, thanks for posting that, Maggie, um, is held up against these criteria. And so it, it starts with that. And that becomes the lens through which you see every competitor and it becomes kind of the rubric that you might score them against. I, I've, I've taken a lot of inspiration from this example. Um, and and it, it, it helps to, uh, to bring a little bit of structure to your analysis. Oh, we pulled it up here. That's awesome. Uh, bring a little bit of structure to the analysis. Uh, you can still obviously go deeper in these areas. You could obviously go you know, down tangents, but you're not starting from scratch when you look at a new competitor to say, okay, what, what criteria do I need to assess this competitor against? It actually gives you a starting point. Notice also that it's not features. Like these are bigger buckets of jobs to be done. They're all verbs. They're all things that a customer would actually do or achieve with the product. They're not as granular as features, um, but obviously if you were to click into them, I'm sure GitLab has all that, that detail. So just a cool example there. I love this. This is so good. The, uh, the other thing that this reminds me of is just the fact that I feel like so many people sleep on a company's website as a good resource for competitive Intel. I mean, at the end of the day, right, a, a, a website is a company's usually number one lead generator. And so it's, it's up to, it's, it's in a company's greatest interest to really share kind of their position in a market. And uh, kind of like what GitLab just did, it's full transparency. And I'm seeing this up just even more like just across all of, uh, all of the companies in my industry. Like they're just really showing uh, exactly like where they're positioning themselves, what they offer, what they don't offer. And uh, I think people think that they need to like really dig in the trenches and like find some secret forum where like all the competitive intel is just right there. Uh, but I'm telling you, in a lot of cases, it's on the corporate website. And it's just up to you to then ask that next question and try to identify kind of, again, where you fit in, the things that you want to take action on. It's so Absolutely. underrated, right? Yeah, like we, we think it's not going to be useful because it's so easy. It's so right in front of us. But like you can read so much into their intentions of their, their messaging. What do you think, Clara? Yeah, I was going to say, I remember starting on my career, you know, seven, eight years ago in CI and, and signing up for this really janky tool that compared website changes over time. Now there's much better tools out there, but I think that the, just like Andy and Alex said, like the gist of it is that that is with their front portal to the world. And that's how they're going to be competitively messaging and putting um, themselves out there. And if you can monitor that change and that messaging adjustment, right, then you can absolutely get ahead in terms of how they're going to market and what they're looking to focus on. Um, I remember specifically, you know, being able to find certain PDFs, right, certain um, marketing changes, and, and it's just a wealth of knowledge. So I couldn't double click on that even more. Yeah. Sometimes it's the simplest thing. You just got to start at square one and then go from there. Yeah. And that's, that's where you would start, right? And then if you have a good sense of the story they're telling, and then you, again, you have your sense of criteria that you're going to assert, you can then dig into their product and their, their actual, uh, their technology and start to maybe find some gaps. Hey, we know that they like to talk about this and they lead with this a lot in their messaging. But if you actually look into the product, there's a Delta there that we can expose. So that that's kind of where you get into, into a little more depth 
uh, when you start seeing those, those differences and changes. Yeah, Alex, I have to say, I love that link that you sent out. It's, it's a fantastic example of external facing CI, which is always a little tricky, right? Some people yeah, yeah. love GitLab's, it. GitLab's extreme, it. yeah. <laughs> yeah, some, you know, sometimes marketing gets it right, sometimes it gets it wrong. Um, yeah. But in this case, what they did was they basically duplicated G2 Crowd, right? They and, and all the review sites out there. And they said, hey, here's the single source of truth from us instead of the derivative mm-hmm. content that you get out there. And what's the stat like? 70% of the buying process already happens before they pick up the phone and call you, right? So yep. mm-hmm. are you in that leadership position to deliver them competitive insights before they even call you? And I think that's an elephant in the room type of conversation for anybody focus on CI. If you haven't gone to that link, it, it is again in the chat. I highly suggest you go there and click around, poke around. Maybe not right now, so during the whole thing, but like later, copy that link and uh, and then and look through it because it is really a, a wealth of information. Xavier, I know that uh, that Cran posted at some point, uh, probably like a little over a year ago, but it was a blog that showed a bunch of external facing um, CI landing pages. There's a bunch of really good examples there too. I don't have it up on, on my browser. Otherwise I'd share the link, but if anyone's interested, I know that Cran has posted similar blogs. If you, if you're looking for inspiration. And we'll send it out with the recording of this link. We'll put together a whole nice little package so you can look at that also. Uh, thanks Andy. It's a really good, really good catch. This next question is a two-parter part one. How do you distribute CI throughout the organization? And then pursuant to that, what are those deliverables? Who's getting them? How are you getting people to actually open those emails and read them and uh, start to use them? Uh, I know that we've all had, as marketers had, you know, and uh, CI professionals had really good insights that didn't always get to the right hands. So how are we making sure that the, the company's activating CI properly across the organization? I'll tell you about one deliverable and then uh, Andy and Clara, I know are pretty next level on their newsletters. So that would be awesome to hear about, I think. I'll tell you about uh, the battle cards that we create. That's one deliverable. Primary audience there is sales and customer success. We host them in such a way that they are available to the whole company though. Um, So we don't try to, uh, in my case, we don't have like battle cards for sales, battle cards for product, battle cards for leaders. I know some uh, CI folks go in that direction that overwhelms me a little bit, quite honestly. So I say battle cards do one job. They help sales and CS understand what to say when customers ask them how we compare to the competition. Um, They are in a format that is uh, dead simple for me to update. They uh, just have some rich text and simple, you know, images and and some videos embedded. Uh, You can get the top talking points about any competitor without scrolling down. And if you've got 10 to 20 minutes to dig into all the depth and technical investigations we've done and pricing details and pricing model, just keep scrolling. And the the, the detail uh, just kind of unravels from there. That's how they're structured. Um, We push updates to those fairly regularly. We communicate those updates almost the way you would communicate a product uh, kind of release notes. Uh, We push those through our competitive Slack channel and, and through email as well. Um, and people actually kind of subscribe to the page to, to see when uh, when there's the latest. One of the most exciting things that we also do with our battle cards is our uh, customer facing teams use a particular note taking app uh, for that sits on top of Salesforce for uh, taking notes on their opportunities. And anytime they use a keyword, like the name of a competitor, those enablement materials, the battle cards and those top talking points literally pop up. And so you'll get clips on gong in our case or chorus where you see a rep kind of just peek to the side of their screen and and start addressing the competitor on the spot um and and, you know kind of internalizing it and putting it in their own words uh that's pretty awesome so that's one type of deliverable um that's uh that that we create for sales and cs and kind of how it gets in their hands yeah to answer the question on the left first and alex loved what you said there you know we're constantly learning from each other and i think that giving people the pulse of information where they're at and where they live is so critical right like so salesforce in that case or whatever your content management system is um is is just critical um so just to answer the question on the left how do you distribute ci throughout your organization depends on your budget right depends on your tools and technologies that you have depends on your investment in say uh, CI portal technology or content management systems, right? So I, there's not a clear answer here. It's obviously you wanna get it to the people as soon as possible uh, to really get 
CI in action in terms of their strategic decision making. So what I've done in the past is I've used all of the above. I've used the CI portal. I've used the newsletter. Um, I've used mass emails. I've used Slack. You know everything under the board or everything under the sun that uh, you know kind of speaks to that. And then what kind of deliverables are they and who receives them? Um, I would say it's very clear to make sure that there's internal stays internal and external goes external. Uh, I always tell salespeople like, you don't want to get on my blacklist if you send this battle card externally. So don't be that person. <laughs> That's awesome. And I, I will say so, and I'm sure Clara will love this, but we have a really good uh, and engaging uh, that's the key word there, Slack channel for our uh, entire organization to talk about competitive intel. Um, so that's in addition to the newsletter, right? I talked about the newsletter at the start of this webinar. That was primarily kind of a, a recap of a month's worth of activity for our executive team. Typically executives are wanting really high level information. They wanna understand strategically kind of like what is the industry doing? What's happening next? And that's great. Um, but there are a lot of like real time insights that you need to make sure that your organization is aware of. And that's something that Slack is really great for. Um, and so what we typically do is we'll have uh, me or another uh, person on my competitive intelligence team, we'll just share insights in real time. And then we open it up so that any, any person that joins the uh, community can engage with it or they can share their own insights. And I think that's really key there. It's making sure that other folks are involved in that process. Kind of like what Alex mentioned uh, at the start of this uh, webinar as well. You know, in a lot of cases, you're just kind of the curator of the information, but the real money is when you can get a lot of other people within the organization talking about competitive information. And that's why I really love uh, Slack as one of the means of communicating that information. Yeah, and I know I work at Slack. That's the obvious elephant in the room here, Andy. But uh, whatever you're using, just make sure that you're echoing a culture of information sharing. You never know where intelligence is going to come from. And that's a core cornerstone of any really solid CI program is that there's that two-way communication. And that feeds your newsletter, right? That feeds your executive briefings. That feeds your battle cards. That feeds your win-loss program. And so I couldn't stress that enough as a just a solid kind of cultural implication to the building of your CI program. For sure, whatever you're using, but if you're not using Slack, you know, consider using Slack. It's, it's pretty good. I don't know if you heard about it, but- uh, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I promise I didn't pay anybody to say this. This is Listen, totally I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't know I was supposed to be tool agnostic, my bad, but yeah, we, <laughs> we use Slack, okay. I am not agnostic, I am I'm in favor of Slack. That is the bias I am sharing freely with all of you. We have used Slack for CI to great effect and our own CI Slack channel is, is always busy. So that is a, a good call. This next question is about the sales team. How do you keep your sales team up to date on competitors, especially in a rapidly changing landscape? I guess we'd start with uh, Andy, because you're off. <laughs> well, we'll go ahead and start. And I'll, I'll, I'll essentially just kind of add on to what I previously said, because right, we just mentioned that um, we use Slack to kind of share information in real time. Um, but the other piece that I will mention is we also have a, a tag as well. And so if anybody is up against like some sort of, uh, in some sort of opportunity where a competitor is mentioned, and maybe they don't, we don't have the specific information that they're looking for in our content management system, then people can just tag competitive questions. And then it's myself and my direct report, we'll jump in and we'll try to help out. And so really it's just, we kind of, again, we're talking about like a culture of sharing. And in this case, we're talking about, okay, everyone is trying to help everyone when it comes to either winning a deal, sharing competitive information, sharing their experiences with learning about specific competitive information. And so I think that that's just the key. I mean, in a lot of cases, these competitive organizations within a company are really small. I mean, product marketing departments are pretty small. And in a lot of cases, competitive intel is just one segment of the product marketing team or the sales enablement team. And so you really have to lean on other folks to be your eyes and ears uh, because they're talking to customers and prospects every single day. And so uh, that's the one thing that I would really, uh, I would really advise you to double down is 
building those relationships with other folks within the company and making sure that they know that you're the person that they should be coming to with, with new competitive information. I would say build up some sort of cadence with the field. And I know this is dependent on bandwidth, but like Andy said, like it can be a newsletter, it can be a monthly training, it can be a lunch and learn, it can be uh, a briefing to the field or in a QBR or something like that. Um, by them knowing what to expect from you, they can then have confidence and trust in your knowledge, right? I think the worst thing that a CI program can do is just be totally silent, right? And that's <laughs> that's really kind of like the echo uh, that sales teams feel um, if that's the case. And how do you keep up to date on competitors? Open the doors to sales because they're on the front lines and they're the ones adjusting based on you know uh, negotiation and pricing and positioning and all of their talking points depends on what the customers say. So if you are in with sales, and have a really tight relationship with them, just like Andy and Alex have echoed, then you actually get fed that information around the quickly changing competitive landscape. In, in Slack, can you track uh, if people are downloading or interacting with those, those links that you sent? Is that like a feature that Slack has? Not to my knowledge, but what I would use as an ex-marketer is a tracking link, right? Okay. Or you, know, you have like microsites that you can create based on your CMS you know, specifically like high spot that I'm thinking of, you can create pitches uh, that will host the content and you can track that. So there's many ways for you to track that. I will absolutely take that to our product management team because I'm sure they're working on something uh, in the in the corner around that because that's a common ask. Cool. Uh, Maybe I'll, I'll add one more right. twist on, one more twist on this question. Um, if you're feeling like your competitive positioning and competitive enablement materials uh, need radical updates with every change in the competitive landscape, they might not be durable enough. Uh, and so you can make this problem a little less acute if you spend the time at some point to develop competitive positioning that isn't just like we have a couple extra features, we have a couple extra bells and whistles, because that stuff can topple over really quickly as soon as a competitor comes out with a me too feature. And then it's like, well, back to back to square one, what makes us different you know, from first principles. If you take that time to develop a competitive position that's more along the lines of, we solve a different problem than them, we solve a bigger problem than them, we have different foundations, we see the world differently than them, that's going to carry you through, you know, maybe a year or two of market activity. And then, okay, maybe there's a sort of a different chapter or a different generation that, um, that unfolds in the market. But the, the pressure shouldn't be so acute that you feel like you have to kind of overhaul your competitive materials with, you know, every product release um, or even, even every month or every quarter, there shouldn't be that radical changes to make uh, to your, to your enablement material. So keep that in mind that there might be some, uh, you might be able to make life a little easier for yourself if you can develop a positioning statement or a thesis that's a little more durable than, than one or two features. Obviously you want to be able to defend that broader positioning statement with actual details of your technology versus their technology. Um, but that should be a supporting detail, not the kind of the main event. Yeah, this reminds me, this is kind of like where competitive Intel, it, it, uh, it works with product marketing, the positioning, the messaging of an organization. I think that this is super, super important. Like I, I saw, um, I'm sure a lot of folks that are on this webinar, they follow Dave Gerhardt. Um, he's a really great just marketing person to follow on any sort of social channel. But he was mentioning in a post a couple of days ago, like HubSpot has had the same kind of slides and story that they've been working with for, for years. Uh, and they don't feel like they need to change that every single time. I mean, can you imagine all the different uh, things that are going on in the competitive landscape for HubSpot? Countless. I mean, that the CRM marketing automation space is huge. Um, but they've been leaning kind of on their positioning and messaging for years, they feel like. And I know that Dave Gerhardt on that same post, he mentioned that Drift is doing that kind of, that same kind of a thing. Um, he had previously left Drift to go to Privy, he came back to Drift and he said, oh, wow, we're still using some of these same slides that we had originally built. And that speaks to the overall company story that they're, uh, that they're telling. And that's an important part of competitive Intel. I'm sure that they established or, or conducted a lot of competitive intel that led to that story. And so definitely make sure that you're weaving that into 
uh, any of your like quick dismisses or anything like that. It should all tie back to the company story. A great way to find that up. And uh, I agree. Next question. What is the best way to make sharing competitive intel a two-way channel between product marketing and sales customer facing teams? We touched on this a little bit uh, in talking about you know the Slack and just kind of having that regular cadence. Is there anything else you want to touch on with regards to making sure that like both teams are sharing information freely? Yeah, you can absolutely have competitive office hours, right? And that's if and when you're in a position to support sales. Um, some programs are not oriented that way, not for everybody, but if you are in a position to kind of support competitive deals that do come up, Office Hours has been a saving grace for a lot of people in sales to come and listen and learn from other competitive deals out there so that you don't have to have the same conversation 20 times with sales reps. I've also um, experienced that uh, you can do a monthly focus group between product marketing and sales and customer facing teams. Uh, another kind of listening session as well uh, to get their field feedback. So you constantly want to be testing the content that you put out, whether it's whether it's product marketing or CI or whatever the, the derivative uh, deliverable is, you definitely want to make sure that that door is open for back and forth communication. And personally, I've, I've jumped on a lot of sales calls too to see this actually delivering an action. And that has been really helpful to understand how do they pitch it, right? And if you have something like Gong or Chorus, you can listen to it afterwards and understand what does that actually look like in action? Yeah, super, super important. I would also add that um, in order to, I mean, obviously like we, we want to invite this conversation to take place between CI, sales, marketing, product, um, but I think it's also important to remember that in a lot of cases, uh, these departments have a lot of things on their plate and they have to be interested in the conversation or in the act of sharing. And so that means that you need to either create a culture, and we, we've said this before, creating a culture of sharing, but we also need to make sure that the output uh, that of the things that we're creating is actually interesting and relevant to all of our audiences. So for example, um, in my competitive Intel Slack channel. This wasn't something that I pushed to every single seller, marketer, product manager within Zoom Info. This is something that I created and I told uh, the main like stakeholders, I would say, of our departments. And then we started the conversation. The conversation was good enough that all of a sudden, oh, let's invite a couple of other folks to participate. And then it becomes this thing that's not really like, a mandatory like, okay, uh, red light competitive intel, we need you, like that kind of a thing. It, it, the vibe is different. It's more of something that, oh, this is cool. Like we're all just kind of talking about competitive intel, uh, this experience, I'm sure this is going to inform uh, how I'm going to approach my job moving forward. So, you know, you just kind of, it's, this is kind of vague, but it's really important. I feel like ensuring that competitive intel is an interesting thing that people want to participate in that's going to be hugely important to the eventual communication that, you, that you're looking for between yourself and all these other departments. So just keep that in mind as you're creating all of the content and collateral. Make sure that it's, that it's, uh, it's, it's inviting for these yeah. other conversations to take place. Yeah, you're inviting people to be part of a new process, to be part of a new practice. You're not inviting them to sit there in the audience and like listen to you for 45 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Like. Um, it is always a conversation. It's never done. Like there are deliverables, but it's never done. And, and we need you to be a part of this. Um, I'll give you even uh, a little phrase that always helps me set a tone, the tone of sharing, um, which is, you know, if I'm, if I'm delivering some kind of enablement to sales team or even a briefing to executives, uh, it's from what I've seen or from what we've seen, if you've already looked at it with a small group. And as soon as you just kind of qualify what you're about to share with a little tag like that, it instantly takes kind of the, the pressure off of you to present yourself as this like, you know, lecturer that's just presenting all this expert knowledge. You're obviously going to defend your point of view and show a little bit of your process and of your work. But then what's the natural follow up to that? It's what have you seen? What examples have you seen that maybe might support this theme or this finding or insight that I'm presenting or might run counter to it and give us some caveats to consider or some exceptions where this idea doesn't quite apply. 
Um, so that's a big one for me uh, is, is approaching it with that humility uh, to present a point of view and then be ready to, to um, have healthy debates and discussions about it. And the other really practical thing I would say is um, sometimes I feel like as marketing teams, we kind of talk about our sales partners as this like big blob of like the sales team. And, and it's kind of this like distant aggregate way of talking about that group. I would really encourage you to, to actually spend the time to cultivate relationships with individuals. And as Claire, to Clara's point, you can do that through uh, actually supporting them on individual deals. I, I would not uh, ever, you know, sort of turn my nose up at that being too tactical or, or too ad hoc. In fact, for me, that, that's been uh, the basis of a function that gives me this rich, high resolution information that I, I can then aggregate and synthesize and, and bring to other forums. Um, but, you know, just a one-on-one -on -one, uh, check-ins with uh, particular sales reps, the ones that are, there's probably a few that are more active than not in your competitive Slack channel. Maybe, uh, you, you know, just ask them for a virtual coffee um, and, and put a face to the name. Um, those real relationships, uh, you know, especially if, if you like, like me, we're, we're all still fully remote. I feel like uh, are incredibly high leverage and, and worth the small time commitment. Absolutely, Alex. Yeah, I would also add, you know, to think about a creating a working group or a pilot group or whatever title you want to make them feel really special around uh, for have them to check your content, right? And to double check, you know, what is coming through the pike and making sure that that communication is two ways is so critically important. And I always say like my kind of catchphrase, Alex said his catchphrase around, you know, of what I know, or, you know, frame it around what we've heard from customers. I always say the more information I have, the more information I can work with. And if that is just not coming back from the person, but they're being very critical, say maybe it's an executive or a salesperson, I try to enlist them and enable them in the next set of content creation to kind of flip it back on them and say, this is what I got. What do you think? How can we make this better? And how can we be partners together versus like a service arm? Because you never want CA just to be pumping out content and updating battle cards, right? That's the worst thing that it can do. But if it's in this feedback loop of continuous improvement, then you have, you know, a well-oiled machine in that regard. I'd be curious. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure Alex and Clara, both of you have, are pretty, uh, are pretty good at changing your mind when you, when you're presented with new information. <laughs> like I, that's something that I've had to learn how to do. Uh, Cause I, you know, I, I came from the sales world um, and, uh, you know, once I first started out with competitive Intel, I like had my opinion and I wanted to really run with that. And even though some other folks on the product or sales team, like they would come with new information and I would feel like really stuck in like my opinion on no, this competitor meant this thing. And, um, that it, you just can't have that attitude if, if you want to be successful, um, if you want to build a successful CI organization, I've, I've learned to now be like, Oh, I did not know that. Okay. We need to, I need to change course and probably adjust some collateral, uh, and, uh, and insights, but yeah, those, those are all super important insights from both Alex and Clara, for sure. I always joke, Andy, I say to anybody I present to, I say, keep me honest, because I'm better because yeah. of the relationship. So this is what I know, but to have that humble attitude is so critical because you never know when you might be wrong or a little bit off or have outdated information. Mm -hmm. At the core of CI is remaining curious. And every time you think you know everything, that means you become incurious and that you're not doing your job very well. So I think you are all spot on. Our next question, when a competitor has 50% or half of the market share, where can we showcase our expertise when the questions come up about us being new to the market? So this is, I guess, a question again for the smaller folks who are maybe trying to compete with bigger players, players who are coming up in every single deal. Uh, where can they showcase their expertise when, uh, when those questions come up? Yeah, this this sounds like a, this is a pretty specific market dynamic of the the startup versus the incumbent. Um, I might call back to to the point we were talking about earlier of having that uh, that competitive positioning that's kind of that's a little bit of a bigger worldview rather than we just have a you know we have a few new features or something like that. Um, I think you you might need to develop a story that's really based on how they solve the problem or they think about the problem in the old way whatever that old way is to, to you and your space. Um, and then something fundamental has changed in the world or changed in how these teams that you serve work. Um, and that's where, where we were born. 
Um, if I were to infer, you might also be dealing with some sweet versus uh, best of breed dynamics, uh, which I've, I've been on kind of both sides of that positioning before. Um, and so if you are the, the best of breed, you're then arguing for uh, this, this customer to, uh, to sort of walk away from some component of the suite that they're already paying for in order to get a better tool that, that maybe just does one or two things, which might, might be your newer tool. Um, and again, that, that, that argument has to be based in the notion that, that something fundamental has changed in the customer's world uh, since the time that they invested in this, this what, might, what you might now call a legacy solution. Um, that, those are like the general kind of silhouettes of competitive positioning that I've seen in, in like a startup versus incumbent situation. Clara, what have you seen here? Feel free to talk about the talk about it from both sides. If you want to talk about like incumbent versus startup and like, you know, yeah, being yeah. a bigger player and a smaller player, uh, I think both of those answers have merit. So feel free to, you know, kind of tackle it from either side. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Alex, for the tee up here. I've seen it and I've been on both sides as a competitive intelligence analyst where I've been at a best of breed solution, fighting up against the full suites like Oracle, SAP, um, the like, you know, IBM, et cetera, et cetera. And then I've been on the other end of being part of the full suite provider when I used to work for Oracle NetSuite. So I understand how to run both sides. Happy to geek out with anybody. If you have a very specific use case, feel free to find me on LinkedIn. Um, I really want to pay it forward in the market um, in terms of what I've learned. But where I would go for where I would kind of come from in terms of this question and where I would go is understanding the customer needs. And when you're a smaller startup provider, you're hyper focused and hyper innovative around those customer needs. And customers will feel that, especially if you understand their industry deeper. So I think as a smaller provider out there, you know, market share is not your focus. Your focus should be on the customer innovation and the customer need. And then you can get market share. Like, obviously, you're not going to win. You're not going to get the other 50% of the market share. Of course, that's the goal. But I would say focus on how to serve your customers better than the competitor. And then you'll, you'll naturally get a lot of legacy rip and replaces to your side. Yeah, I would add, too, like, I think because we talk about the customer a lot and that's obviously the most important thing. There's also a really good perspective though, coming from your founder in a lot of cases. So if there's an incumbent provider and your founder still chose to create a new product, it's likely that they saw some sort of problem or they experienced some sort of problem and they wanted to solve it. Granted, it's probably unique to a specific uh, segment within this overall category that maybe the incumbent, you know, it has multiple arms in, but still like leverage that as part of your competitive strategy as well. You created your product because you saw a problem with how the way, with the way that things were done. You realize that other folks were experiencing that same problem and you're coming out to solve it. And that's why it's really important also. And this is again, more of like a product marketing best practice or just marketing, I guess, in general, but you really need to make sure that you have an ample amount of proof points that show that your product is really working. I think it's obviously it's great if you can have a proof point that shows you beating out a competitor, maybe displacing them and them seeing a greater ROI because of it, but you don't even need that all the time. I think that in a lot of cases, just having really good case studies that show uh, companies implementing you uh, over what whoever that incumbent is, I think that that really speaks volumes in any sort of uh, deal situation. And it can I don't think that would work that more Yeah, yeah. I'll add one more piece here to 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 um, characterize both sides again. Whether you're the startup, the incumbent, I'll drop another link on you all. There's this uh, this consultancy and research bunch of people that are super smart called corporate visions. I'll put in the chat here. Um, they have some really powerful ideas on how your positioning needs to be quite different when you are the one asking the customer to make a change. So a new land basically versus when you are the incumbent. Um, we generally as marketers are very comfortable with the why change, why now story. We're a little less comfortable. It feels a little bit more awkward to us when um, we are the incumbent. And actually when you're the incumbent, everything you do needs to be about playing up the uh, bias for the status quo, the bias for inertia that the customer has, obviously expanding as well and, and getting into other problems. Um, 
but you you actually need to be doing things like um, leading with the, uh, the the outcomes that those customers have already achieved with you over the past three or four or five years of them working with you. Uh, you have the benefit of um, an, an actual track record of, of hopefully proven positive results that you can remind that customer of, so that when this uh, you know upstart comes along, they they really feel quite uh, unproven. So that's that's another a difference that I've found very illuminating is when you're when you are the upstart, it's all about trying to get that customer to to kind of disrupt their status quo. When you're the incumbent, you are trying to actually preserve the status quo because you are the status quo. And I can add one, one more thing. Just, just speaking from the incumbent point of view, too, because I think this is really important. I think um, you know, as you're gaining speed in the market and you become kind of that go-to solution, at some point in time, your sellers are probably going to not need to spend as much time talking about competitors. And that's definitely a position where I see a lot of these like larger companies taking it's okay. Yeah. You, you might be asking me a question about a competitor. I can address that really quickly, but then like, let's kind of dismiss that and then go back to the conversation we were having about our solution and how that can continue to help you. I think that in a lot of cases, once you become that larger company, the competitive Intel, like the really nitty gritty stuff, it starts to really help the product team because they want to see, okay, there are these small agile companies that are trying to beat us out and they're trying to create new product that out innovates us. And so they really need to be kept in the loop. I would almost say a little bit more so than the sales and marketing folks who can now kind of sit back and talk more about the story. And they can talk again, a little bit more about the ROI that a customer's already seen where again, when you have these other competitors that are smaller and more, I guess, um, quicker to out innovate, that's when it's really more important to start looping in your product teams to make sure that they're all aware of what they need to be doing. For sure. I didn't mean to cut you off, Andy, uh, but I do I encourage people to go to that link that Alex sent out um, because this is a, obviously a, a topic you can talk about at a great length and think about a great length. So really follow up with that link and um, definitely reach out uh, if you have more questions, especially if they're like a little wonkier. Next question. Ooh. What are the best practices for gathering competitive pricing when it's not publicly available. So how do you go about getting that, that secret pricing intel when it's not on the website, for example? I think we all kind of half smile at this one. And I'm glad this is the last question because this is really where I kind of slot it in my list of priorities. Not to, not to put down the question, it's totally natural to want to have that precision of what exactly are they quoting customers um, you go to their pricing page commonly if you're in, if you're in SaaS like uh, the three of us, and you see you know free plan, pro plan, basic plan, and they all have price points. And then enterprise is like contact us, and it just like leaves you hanging, right? Um, in my experience, it is very tempting to try to spend a lot of time trying to trying to pin these down, um, and it's absolutely worth you know some uh, advanced googling. For example, for example, Clara touched on this. You can dig up PDFs and uh, of, of quotes and pricing and contract that are just on the web. Um, you know, you might have luck if there's, uh, if they've sold into the public sector at all. A lot of those budget review meeting minute notes are just out in, uh, out in the world. Uh, there's things like that. Um, you can also ask in win loss interviews, maybe towards the end of the interview. Okay. How, you know, I understand there's a bunch of strengths and weaknesses we've discussed here. Ultimately, how did things compare on price? And you might just get even something directional, if not an exact price point. Um, However, uh, I would try to draw the line uh, and, and sort of preserve your calories for, for other uh, types of, of research and investigation. And perhaps more important than identifying exact price points, because they can vary so much by discount and by account, like it, it's not going to be very predictive necessarily. Uh, you might want to spend a little more time understanding their pricing models and practices. Are there particular stages in a, in a deal where they might be more likely to discount? Claire, you shared a, a cool story with me on that. If you want to go more into that, that particular learning, um, are there, uh, you know, are, are there particular license types that they have a harder time uh, pricing accurately or fairly for the customers might give them a harder time for So pricing model, pricing practices generally for me has been more predictive and useful than exact price points. Um, Claire, what are your thoughts on this one? 
Yeah, this is a loaded question. And, you know, personally, I always abide by Skip's kind of guidelines of collecting intelligence. Uh, there are firms out there that do pricing intelligence, so you can easily find them there. Google away if that's how you want to do it. And if that works for your kind of legal um, guidelines there, but I would 100% agree with Alex here. You know, once you get a price quote, it's outdated. So to follow that kind of breadcrumb down the trail is is extremely time intensive. I would say to Alex's point around, you know, discounting strategies, right? If they know that you're in the deal, expect a 20 to 30% discount. This is something that you can easily get from your salespeople if you listen and learn from them. Same thing with modeling, just like Alex said, and understanding are they threatened by you? And can you give the customer that heads up? So, you know, I've worked with a lot of sellers and they've told their customers, oh, by the way, like they're going to come in with a really heavy discount against us because they're threatened by us, because their value, because of X, Y, Z reason. So that's been a great tip off to kind of build trust with customers as well. If you know that they're heavily discounting against you. Yeah. I don't know if I have much to I don't know if I have much to add on top of that. Both of you uh, pretty much nailed it. I would just say like, again, to reiterate, having those conversations in like a win-loss setting, having those conversations with your sales team directly. And if you have access to a conversation intelligence tool like Chorus, then you can have, then you can listen to those conversations pretty much at any point in time. But I would think that those would be the, the primary tools for gathering that information. So we are coming up on the hour. I do want to give you all a little bit of time to, if you have any kind of overarching thoughts, if you want people to find you anywhere, uh, if you want to share anything that hasn't come up naturally in this conversation, I will seat the floor to, to the three of you before we uh, get out of here. Go for it, Clara. No, all you, Andy. I, I, I left myself off mute. So that's the indicator, I guess, that we're trying to... <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, no, no. This is an awesome conversation. I, I definitely implore anyone to follow both Alex and Clara on uh, LinkedIn. They both uh, provide a lot of really great um, materials, not just for competitive Intel, but for product marketing in general. Um, so can't recommend either of them enough. Um, I also try to post um, a decent amount of competitive Intel best practices and just things from my experience at Zoom Info pretty frequently on both LinkedIn and Twitter. So if you want to find me there, uh, definitely feel free to give me a follow and reach out. And I'd love to have a conversation just about any other questions that you might have with competitive Intel. Andy, you said it so well, and I would highly recommend Andy. I promise you didn't pay me to say this, but he is truly a, a thought leader in our space and will give you a, a, a laugh and a smile when you read his posts, absolutely. And Alex is such an incredible um, thought leader as well. He's worked really closely with the PMA and uh, couldn't speak more highly of my two fellow panelists, but happy to connect with anybody on LinkedIn, have one-off conversations, know that you're not alone in this industry. There's so many resources and so many people out there that want to support you and want to connect you. Um, and I just want to encourage you to keep doing, keep doing the hard work and know that, you know, you're not alone and that we're here to support Alex. I'll flip it over to you to close us out. You're, you're not alone is the, the ultimate, I think, closing piece of wisdom for anyone in CI. I think all three of us, as, as we've shared, kind of started in this work, feeling like we're on our own islands. And then we got connected with each other, connected with other like-minded people. And you realize how much faster you can move uh, when you're willing to kind of share your lessons learned and, and approach every conversation with humility. Um, I have a plug. My, my big project at the moment, as, as Clara alluded to, is uh, in collaboration with the Product Marketing Alliance, the good people over there. Uh, we're launching a course uh, in uh, less than 10 days time on, uh, on competitive intelligence. So it's about uh, two hours plus of, of uh, video content, self-paced. It's my attempt at distilling everything that I wish I knew when I was getting started in this line of work. Um, and so really excited to kind of finally get that into, into people's hands. It's been a ton of work. Um, but uh, yeah, follow me on LinkedIn and, uh, and, and feel free to, to message directly and, and get connected. Thank you everybody for coming. Special thanks to Alex, Andy, and Clara. This is really interesting. I'm gonna be watching this myself. We'll send out the recording and I'll send out some of those links that came up also. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Crayon, to reach out to Alex, Clara, Andy on LinkedIn. Uh, and otherwise, I will give you back to your days. Thanks everybody again and uh, have a Thanks, good day. Thanks Xavier for hosting. Thank Great you, job. Xavier. Thank yeah. you everybody for attending. All right.